I guess so. I, well, and there's still more seats up front if anybody wants to grab them, rather than stand in the back or anything. Oh, is this a good mic placement and everything? I just tossed it on myself. Excellent. <laughs> All right, so I, my name is Sean O'Toole, and I'm going to be speaking to you about metamorphic viruses. And I wanted to stress that I know this whole co conference is educational purposes only, but I want to stress that this one is definitely because I don't want to see anybody's grandmother not be able to access their email or something because I gave a speech. And you know, you, you guys are the computer guys of the, uh, your families, so you know if they have a problem, you're going to hear about it. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, my speech on metamorphic viruses, I'm going to start off with uh, going through like some pseudocode on how the various modules work. And then after that, I'll talk about like some of the AV approaches to it. And also, uh, on the CD, I wanted to mention uh, that I did have uh, some misspellings, but you know it was a late night presentation that I was putting together after a friend's birthday, so you know what happens. <laughs> so uh, as we go on, I just wanted to give you a couple of the definitions. One from Peter Zor, who's a uh, well-known. Uh, antivirus person down to like your virus people and it goes from body polymorphics where they swear they've always been around in simpler techniques down to the artist's extreme mutation so we got that going now I'm going to give a uh, brief description of all of the uh, various sections or the main sections that you'll see or are theorized the first one is the disassembler which uh, mainly it usually has some way of putting something into a structure or something, a lot of reverse engineering tools and whatnot. And then the second is the depermutator, which uh, takes the code that's been shuffled and connected by jumps and puts it straight down to uh, the straightest code uh, that the algorithm can put it back together with. And uh, also the shrinker, which takes opcodes and uh, recombine or clusters of opcode and recombines them. Say like if you have a push EBX, pop ECX, it becomes a move ECX, comma EBX type of thing. So these two, first, or two and three are mainly the ones that get you back down to the skeleton of your virus that it can be expanded on later with it. these ones, the expanders, that I, which will do exactly the reverse of the shrinker, and the permutator, which shuffles the code, links it with jumps and so forth. And also, we get down to the reassembler, or the reassembler or assembler, which uh, places the uh, virus back together, fixes jumps, and so forth. And these six are the main ones that you'll see or hear theorized. Like a shrinker is very rare. Expander, permutator, those are ones that are more used. And here's just one that I want to go over really quick, is when you're programming these viruses or looking at them, you've got to think in AI very software engineering type of thinking towards it because you know you want to think in modules everything's separate we just pass this information to this one so you don't end up getting into this huge project that never finishes so we get down to the disassembler we have two choices one is I one that I haven't really passed across but is heavily theorized to make a pseudo language so that you can change like Say if you want to go from ELF to uh, I, x86, you can change a few things in there through your pseudo language before you put it back down into uh, the uh, I assembly language. And also we have reverse engineering tools, which I, the zombie are, is the main person that puts those together. The LDE was an earlier version of the ADE, which has a linked list of I structures. And the structure is I actually inside with that module when you get it so you can look at kind of like the manual and it will tell you basically what's, what you got to deal with after you run it. Oh, and also that one of the things about the disassembler is also that it's not always able to reverse engineer all files. It just has some. So there's, it's, it cuts out some of the selection pro process. And here's one from I, the Mental Drills article, Practice on Metamorphism, that's a uh, 
little example of how you can put together your pseudo AI language. One is that you could, I, well, you have the opcode, the instructions tell you, of course, which registers and whatnot. LM, which is label marker, which tells you later if there's a label that points to that that maybe jump to. And this is very important for shrinkers and so forth because if you shrink an instruction and there's a label in between that cluster, then you've just basically screwed up the whole thing that it's jumping to because you've added too much code into one area. Also, uh, we have like the idea of how to deal with the opcode. You can say that move is to 40. If you're doing memory to register, it's plus two. So move high memory to register would become 42. And there's also a full list of uh, the idea of putting pseudo opcodes uh, op like this in the same article. So now we, we get down to the depermutator because uh, the other choice for the assembler can, or disassembler can be found uh, in its manual pages. And the depermutator, as I said earlier, just deshuffles the uh, code, if you will. And this can be put in uh, its own module or can be included in the disassembly process, depending on which way you'd like to go. And here's like the pseudocode at the beginning. You, you got the variables that, like um, you start out with the entry point of the uh, what you're disassembling or depermutating. Uh, you have a path marker, which is your buffer for after your depermutating code. A label, which is two D words. One is the uh, old address of the code, and one is the new address of the code, which later on some of these won't have an old address, which we'll uh, see. And this is very important for jump fixing later on as well as other things. And the future jump label table, which has labels that you don't want to deal with yet through the algorithm. And you, of course, zero out the path markers so you don't end up hitting random uh, opcodes that are just somewhere, something that was in that buffer so that you think that this could be a portion of what you're depermutating. And uh, you translate the uh, current uh, instruction pointer into the ESI. And then I, here's what you do for a jump. If you have a jump and you've already depermutated it, of course, you just jump it back to that. And that's, that's one of the things about this algorithm that makes you know that you cannot have the same uh, depermutated that virus every time. You may have a, a jump from a couple generations back that the algorithm never really took out. And then if you uh, have not depermutated yet, you put in a no op unless it's just in case it's being pointed to. And then you just go on from where the jump leads you. And then you have the conditional jumps, which uh, a lot of times are just kept in there. And uh, they're put in the future label table and whatnot. You can see everything here. Calls, same as uh, conditional jumps. Returns, just goes to the future label table, so you move uh, one uh, branch up the, co or one leaf up the code tree and get back to it. And then here's a little note I wanted to make sure that I, we had on there, which is when getting a new EIP from the future label table, we check if the labels stored here are already been depermutated. If they are, then it, we insert the corresponding labels at the, at the label table and eliminate the entry and future label tables. If not, we get the uh, new EIP continue. And also, I just had like a little note here for if you're making it standalone and whatnot, you're going to have to do a lot of more uh, list things if you're doing it standalone because in two buffers, so that's one of the reasons it's usually in the disassembler. It will take up less room. And here's a little example here. And we see that I X, the triple X's are the uh, code that mean, is meaningful, and so the Y codes are the ones that are unreachable. So this is another thing that your deep per permutator will help you do. It will allow you to put in worthless code that will never be reached so that it's just in there. It makes it look different. We see this be beforehand. We got the conditional jump. We got some of the other jumps. After it runs, we got this. No more of the Ys that are useless instructions. Once you get a jump, it links you straight to the, where it, that code was, goes through there until 
you've hit it all, and that's what's there. And then we get to the shrinker, which is uh, extremely rare to find and will reappear in our AV section. And uh, this is basically, the, like I was saying, the inverse of the expander. And uh, it's most, I haven't run upon it, so that's why it's not in, I, I don't have any examples of it anywhere. And so uh, we have the pseudocode for that right here, which we can see is basically looking through and seeing if we can find code clusters and switching them back to their uh, most simple ones, which I, I, I do it as if there is a list of uh, these conversions, but many times it's just a whole function that just does one thing. Then we get to the expander, which I, is the inverse of the uh, shrinker. <laughs> and I, basically, that, that's usually a standalone thing, and usually also those don't use a list or anything to see what the conversions are. Mainly, they're just functions that are already written out, like the uh, when 9x uh, Ramones virus will have some of these uh, so that you can uh, take a reference point to see how they're done. And here's the pseudocode for that. We have uh, is expandable. I forgot to switch it to an actual number rather than a Boolean. But basically, I, the, the expandable qu question is how many times can we, exp or how can we expand it? Three uh, opcodes, two opcodes, or just switch opcodes? And it goes through and it says, okay, if we got this random number, and we got this, we're going to do it. And that's basically that pseudocode. And that's just by telling you about how you can make a expandable or is expandable type of thing. It shows zero, there's no uh, way to expand it. Seven, you can expand it all three different ways. And uh, up and down the line with the uh, various combinations. And that's on the same thing. So we get to the uh, permutator, which you can see in uh, the ghost virus, CPERM as well as in a lot of other zombie viruses. And here's the pseudocode for that, which basically uh, goes through, like, well, this one's when it's actually kind of shuffling beforehand. So it just puts the code groups together, puts a jump in after that code group. And then we come into this one, which goes to the jump, and it inserts the uh, proper address to jump to the next code group in the sequence. Oh, I also forgot to mention I changed my presentation a little bit, so it's uh, different from the one on the CD. But uh, if yeah, it's just so if you're following along on a computer, just so you don't get lost, I've made a lot of changes. Uh, in the in the assembler section, the main thing that you have to worry about, rather than the whole like converting all the stuff, is the main thing is to do jump relocation fixes, which so I uh, your old point or your old jump will go to the proper jump once it's reassembled in the new, uh, new program. And here we uh, usually initialize a couple tables, one that's uh, eight bytes long, four bytes for where the new instruction pointer is, four bytes for where the old instruction was located. And then we have a jump table, which basically lists uh, the offsets of our jumps and jump in to the instructions so we can check. And they're the older jumps, so you can check these old jumps match. Now we should change it to this new one. And basically, that's what this for loop does with the if in it. Checks to see, goes through if there's still uh, jumps to be processed. It goes to the jump table and goes through until it hits the end. And then uh, I comes down and sees if the uh, old uh, jump table address is the same as the uh, New or the old jump table address in the EIP table, and then assigns the new one if the old ones match. Other ideas that have come up about this is one of them was that I, it, it's been an extremely old idea. It's been done a lot. Even I can't think of any of the DOS viruses, but there have been ones I have done that, and it's register exchange. One generation. You have EAX doing all these operations for you. Next generation, you may have EBX doing it, which will change. If you're doing a signature scan, it changes the opcode. Then we have I entry point obscuring techniques, which have been fairly popular. So they, basically, that is when you uh, put a I jump or a call at the host's entrance, 
and the uh, file, and then it jumps straight to the uh, virus code, runs it, jumps back. And then there was uh, one that's only uh, been seen in the ZMist virus, which is unknown entry point. And what that does is it interjects uh, the virus straight into the uh, stream of code, which this can be done with your uh, reassembler after disassembling both the host and the uh, previous generation virus. And then we have other modules that you see a lot of them, like uh, trash code generation that was big during uh, I love email spreading viruses and worms and whatnot. And uh, I, that one can be added, but there's uh, a drawback that will be that uh, your code will keep on growing throughout, which what always happens with a uh, garbage code generator. But also, this can be used to uh, change, like, uh, signatures, and we'll see why this might be, become important with a new type of AV technique that they're thinking of making. And then we have encryption, I, be it polymorphic, be it just regular encryption. These things are, uh, you can also include them, but you have to be careful how you do it so that, say like, uh, sometimes a flag will be thrown up because you're using a certain technique to uh, polymorphically encrypt and decrypt your virus. But say a, a properly done one would be, ZMIST is a great example of that one too, which is one of the greater viruses out there. And I, what it does is it acts exactly like a, a file that will decompress at runtime when it uses its polymorphic uh, engine. So I, here comes the start of our AV section. I just want to put up this quote from I, an article about ZMIST I, that says that uh, metamorphism is something that's going to be pretty crazy and we need to find out something to do for it. And uh, since ZMIST and uh, the uh, unexpected entry point have been written by Zombie, I found an article by Zombie that uh, shows what the implications of doing this would be. And uh, you have your variables, and this is basically saying if you're doing a signature scan, you have to run through it until you know you're definitely on the virus. You don't know how long that will take. So I, well, I've been mentioning signature scans, so just in case if people don't know, I had like a little slide to uh, tell you about signature scans, which is basically uh, the oldest technique for virus uh, finding viruses, and it's just to check a uh, string of bytes or so forth to see if it matches a signature in a database. And if those match, then most likely you have a virus. And, uh, and there's many other things. Say, like, uh, ZMIST is my major example because that's the uh, one that uses the most metamorphic techniques uh, as a date that I've seen. And uh, in his, uh, he puts a Z in the DOS header. And uh, that, that is his mark for I've infected that file. So, and these are, you need these marks so you don't constantly infect the same file. And it's, uh, but it's still a constant struggle in between will the virus recognize it, will the AVs recognize it. And one thing is this one's uh, somewhat ambiguous because a Z is allowed in that portion of the header. And so that, you know, sometimes the virus may not uh, infect every file it can. Infecting ones that are already or not infected. And at the same time, the AV will look at it and say, we're really not sure this could be a legitimate Z, or it could be a Z placed by the virus. And next we come on to geometric scanning, which uh, is one of the downfalls of like poly polymorphism. And, uh, but we see with ZMIST, it was able to beat it by acting like a uh, runtime self-decompressing self file. And uh, so in the, basically what a geometric scan does is check the size changes in the file so they can say, all right, this is acting like this, this is acting like that, because the uh, initialized data section's grown this much. And then we have the possible answers, because we saw that ZMIST had beaten the previous ones. And one of them is to uh, combine various techniques uh, and use kind of a heuristic idea. But this uh, fails because it takes a lot of time, and nobody's going to run anything if it takes a lot of time. And also, that there's always like anti-emulation, debugging, all that type of stuff, uh, techniques coming out so that some of these uh, techniques will fail. The AV techniques will fail if uh, they try to uh, use them with these other 
anti-star, whatever you want to call them, techniques included. And the second, which I, is a fairly new one, and I actually was looking around the internet and I saw that there's somebody that might be talking about this at the uh, vi Virus Bulletin at conference. And it's to use the shrinker, like we were talking, one of the parts of uh, the virus, the shrinker and the depermutator, so that you can have this uh, virus depermutated and shrink to its skeleton. And that's where the uh, executable trash generator being left in there could help it out because at its skeleton, you'll still have opcodes that weren't there a generation beforehand. And so, yeah, and we, we see the flaws in the answers. So we, they take too long. You're not able to do some techniques if they include various ways of programming. And I, but the shrinker is the closest one we have, so that's what they have to go with. And I, I just want to include a section that's why this might be stronger for, uh, compared to other techniques. And trash generation, of course, you just have worthless code and the virus grows loads and loads every time it uh, passes the generation. So after a while, a file will get big enough and they'll know that something's happened. And also in polymorphism, uh, the body usually, you can always take like a static picture of the body or at least portions of the body at times throughout the running of the virus. So you can know that though it's decrypted now, it all, or it's encrypted now, it always has to decrypt itself. So you have the same code once it's decrypted. Well, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, kind of new to the speaking to large crowds, so I might have flew through that too fast, but I just wanted to open the floor to uh, question and answer or anything like that. Yes? I've, are, are we talking about the uh, with the polymorphism? I, th it's it's possible that this, this could happen, but I, I haven't really checked too much into polymorphism to tell you the truth. I just looked at a few techniques and saw what they did, and but I I, I haven't really caught any like I software stuff for doing the uh, decryption methods for like brute forcing the detection. I'm sorry. Yes? Uh, the, the standard part that finds the process of detecting the virus or not is, can be detected as a signal because you have to be a, sta a standard part which is not a creature, is not, uh, is always the same. Uh, can, it, can, it, can it be used to detect that that is your virus, your virus? I, which, which section were we talking about? I mean, the, the, the part that finds the process of the, the creature. I it's hmm. I I'm sorry. I, I can't really hear you too well up here, so I kind of miss pieces, and I think they're important. Right. There is a part that is common to all. It's not encrypted. It's uh, not uh, polymorphic, which is the start of the virus. Is that the signature that can be easily recognized? I will. Wait. With the eyes, with the eyes, will we have to be eyes? Yeah? I will. Well, his question was uh, if I recognize it correctly, is there a uh, static part in metamorphic viruses that can always be recognized? And the, the thing is, is since I. It can always be randomly expanded or uh, permutated. It, it, you could step through it, but of course you'll still have different opcodes because of the expander or register exchange type of thing. So that that's one that that's where the strength in is uh, with this is that you can change like opcodes, and that's where mainly signatures are strings of opcodes. Do you think that AD software is going to have to run down? The I'd recognize changes. I, I, I haven't looked too much into that, but that sounds like an interesting idea that could be tried. Because mainly what I've heard is the shrinker idea, which will give you the code skeleton. Yes.
Oh, this, this, is the, this is how it shows how ridiculous viruses have gotten. Say, like, if you have uh, not even all of the major six I, I was talking about, but maybe you say four of them. I say, like, the Z-Mist virus, I remember that being, I, I want to say, around 70, 80 pages or so, and some of it's also done in C, so, you know, that makes it even bigger. So it's, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I well, the, the thing is, is I uh, with with this virus basically re rewrote something, or with these viruses, the expander is basically an unoptimizer, which is really funny because, like you know, I back not too long ago, everything had to be optimized for a virus. Nowadays, we're writing things to unoptimize them afterwards. So it it shows that you really don't need optimization because we have so much room to deal with. I, I, it, the techniques, it's no uh, specific technique. Basically, it just looks through and I, well, most of them just look through, compare opcodes, because most of them are functions now, and they'll say like, is this the opcode? If yes, change it to this. Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, the compression is basically like, say for an easy example, I push EBX, pop ECX becomes, I move ECX, comma EBX. Basically, that's it. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> There's ten. <laughs> yeah, I haven't opened up the CD, so I. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Are there any other? Uh, yes, sir. I I'm sorry, sir. Can you stand up? I was, well, with behavior blockers, I don't... Yeah, well, I, I, with the thing with the, I, I, behavior scanners is that if the behavior is found, of course, anything, once you see what it will do, you'll know what's happening. But a lot of times, I... That's that takes a lot of time, and then say like uh, for emulation, sometimes there's ways to, that people have found to block emulation. So, you'd it'd be more of like a uh, integrity scanner than it, than an integrity scanner. Basically, you're already infected, and that's why it knows you're uh, being infected, have been infected. I emulation I. I don't have my notes on it right now, but there's there's a few ways to, uh, if I remember correctly, it's uh, it's placement of like variables uh, below the call, so they I, uh, and it's like one one of the hard coded ones. Like so, if you do I, uh, I think it's like uh, usually if you put the address that you want to put in for your uh, call or jump, and I think it's if you put in the instruction to do like dollar minus four, so it throws it back up in the instruction. I, if I remember correctly, that was one of them. But I, I don't know if I, it's, it's been a while since I've uh, read up too much on that. A good reference? I, let's see, a good reference is, uh, I, I basically say just reading through code is like the best reference. So sometimes, you know, usually you can find some that's common where they say this is this technique being done type of thing, so that, that'd be the best start, I'd say, and best reference. So what I, curr currently, I, I know of some places where you can get, like, uh, viruses that have the uh, comments in them and so forth that use anti-emulation. I don't know if there's, they're still fairly new. And, it, well, usually you can go to the same websites I accessed some of my data off of for uh, 
metamorphism, and they'll talk about that as well. So say like, uh, let's see, I, the zombies website, if you go to his, which is I, z0mbie dot host dot sk, and you would go to some of his links, you'll probably find some on his page and some on some of his link pages that you can I, look at. I, any more questions? Okay, thank you for coming. Also, I'd like to uh, thank my school because uh, they helped, they're going to most likely help me pay for some of the trip over here. So I wanted to thank Regis University. Thank you.